Thank you, Kent. I appreciate your willingness to, to sing that song. The author, uh, William Cooper, was one of the church's great hymn writers. Uh, that was perhaps his most famous one. One that you're probably more familiar with is uh, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. Uh, also wrote that one. He was a man who experienced deep depression throughout his lifetime. His first attacks of despair struck when he was a young man. He was placed into St. Albans Insane Asylum, where he tried to commit suicide many times. One day, one of the doctors there gave him a Bible. He began to read it, and in time, he put his faith in Jesus and was saved. A year after his conversion, he was released from the asylum. He met John Newton. You remember John Newton, the slave trader who became saved, author of Amazing Grace. John Newton became his pastor. They became close friends. They put together a hymnal of hymns that they, they both uh, had written. But in spite of his conversion, in spite of his faith, Cooper still struggled with despair. And in the midst of these attacks, he learned to pursue his God more deeply. And out of these experiences, he wrote that song that we just sang, God Moves in Mysterious Ways. It expresses his unwavering trust in God and, and stands as a testimony to the renewed strength and comfort his troubled heart, troubled heart found in his God. You know, I encourage you to go back and read the words of that hymn slowly, thinking about them. Because how many of you understand the way that God always works? It's mysterious to us at times, isn't it? Even the strongest believers can suffer discouragement and despair. We see that in scripture. We experience it in our own lives. But the trust which Cooper exercised in God steadied his soul. It brought him peace, although he struggled with it throughout his lifetimes. And it's this kind of faith and trust in God during times of discouragement that's expressed in Psalms 42 and 43, which we'll be looking at this morning. I encourage you to open your Bibles there. And yes, we're covering two Psalms today. Psalm 42 is the first Psalm of book two of the Psalms. And Psalm 43 appears to be a continuation of it, a extension of it, an appendix of it. Whatever the case, the refrain used in both of these Psalms is the same or very similar, and it appears they go together. Uh, Psalm 42, at the uh, very beginning, the superscription there, it tells us it's a mass skill. If you remember from last week, that probably means a psalm of instruction. It's teaching us. And although the author of these psalms is not identified by name, it tells us it was written by one of the sons of Korah and was intended for the choir director. Now, who are the sons of Korah? I'm not going to ask you. Uh, Levites, uh, you know, the simple answer is, well, they're descendants of Korah, right? The sons of Korah are his descendants. In your questions, there's some scripture you can look at to, to find out this, but the, the sons of Korah produced and performed music for the worship of God in the tabernacle and in the temple. Before we begin, I want to read something that R.C. Sproul wrote about the topic of these psalms. He says this, quote, the dark night of the soul describes a malady that the greatest of Christians have suffered from time to time. It was the malady that provoked David to soak his pillow with tears. It was the malady that earned uh, for Jeremiah the nickname the weeping prophet. It was the malady that so afflicted Martin Luther that his melancholy threatened to destroy him. This is no ordinary fit of depression, but it is a depression that is linked to a crisis of faith, a crisis that comes when one senses the absence of God or gives rise to a feeling of abandonment by him. Spiritual depression is real and can be acute, he writes. Our faith is not a constant action. It is mobile, it vacillates. We move from faith to faith, and in between we may have periods of doubt when we cry, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We may also think that the dark night of the soul is something completely incompatible with the fruit of the Spirit. Once the Spirit has flooded our hearts with a joy unspeakable, how can there be room in that chamber for such darkness? A Christian can have joy in his heart while there is still spiritual depression in his head. The joy that we have sustains us through these dark nights and is not quenched by spiritual depression. 
The joy of the Christian is one that survives all downturns in life. And then he goes on to say this. This coexistence of faith and spiritual depression is paralleled in other biblical statements of emotive conditions. We are told that it is perfectly legitimate for believers to suffer grief. Our Lord himself was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Though grief may reach to the roots of our souls, it must not result in bitterness. Grief is a legitimate emotion, at times even a virtue, but there must be no place in the soul for bitterness. In like manner, we see that it is a good thing to go to the house of mourning, but even in mourning, that low feeling must not give way to hatred. The presence of faith gives no guarantee of the absence of spiritual depression. However, the dark night of the soul always gives way to the brightness of the noonday light of the presence of God, end quote. So with hearing that, let me ask you this question. How do you respond when the dark nights of the soul come your way? I mean, we live in a very feeling-oriented society and culture. Uh, we hear from, from the world around us, feelings aren't right or wrong, they just are. We're told that we need to get in touch with our feelings, we need to accept our feelings. But as Christians, we need to develop a biblical theology of emotions. And, and we need to measure what the world says by what the scripture says. You know, the Bible clearly tells us that we're to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, right? Right? And discipline, by definition, means going against my feelings. I don't know about you, but I usually don't feel like exercising. But if I'm disciplined, I go against my feelings and do it anyway, right? So we need to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, even in times of despair. And while even the most mature believers are susceptible to this kind of dark nights of the soul... The Bible is clear that we as Christians are to be marked by joy, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. How do we accomplish this? I mean, it seems like two extremes. How do we do both? Well, Psalm 42 and 43 are written to give us that instruction. We're going to read them in their entirety, and then we'll look at them. The psalmist writes, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. Why they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Oh, my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me. Why, they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. And why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre, I shall praise you, O oh God, my God. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you, are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. You know, the psalm begins with a statement of intense desire and longing. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. This was a time of, of, of emotional drought in the psalmist's life, spiritual dryness. 
And his driving passion here is not for, for people or possessions or prosperity. His desire is for God himself. Just, just like a panting deer in the midst of a drought and desperate need for water, the psalmist cries out, My soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. All the hope, all the trust, all the confidence of the psalmist was in his living God. His thirst is for the true God, who, who is self-sufficient, independent, who is willing to come to the aid of his people. And the psalmist's desperation is reflected in the question that he asks, when shall I come and appear before God? Now, he's not denying that God is all present everywhere, no. He's longing for a deeper personal awareness of God as he suffers the loneliness of his alienation and feeling abandoned. His longing for God was intensified by the hostile environment he found himself in, created by those around him who were saying to him all day long, where is your God? They taunt him to doubt the character of his God. And their insult doesn't mean that God didn't exist. That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is your God has abandoned you. It meant where is your God when you need him? I thought God was with you, so where is he? And the psalmist's desperation, despair, was such that he declares, my tears have been my food day and night. The sense of alienation, this sense of being mocked by, by others caused him such sorrow, he lost his appetite. Ever been there? I'm sure you have. Why doesn't God hear my cries? Why doesn't he intervene? Why doesn't he change my circumstances? Why do I feel like I'm abandoned by God? And as he reflects on his circumstances, his mind is drawn to better days, where he says in verse 4, These things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. I mean, he thinks back to the day when he was still in Jerusalem. He remembers the exuberant joy he experienced during the public worship services where he would lead this massive parade to the house of God, jubilant, shouting, praising God, dancing. He no longer experienced that. And, and these pleasant memories, uh, memories become a source of discouragement in the present for him. He thinks back and says, I, I miss those days. He, he's far from home, as we'll see. He feels he's far from God. And, and it's not that he doesn't believe that God is everywhere or that God isn't with him, no. But his being away from home has gotten him down. His absence from Jerusalem was an absence from his work, his purpose for living. And all of this causes him to feel that God is absent from him, or at least far from him. But he doesn't surrender to his discouragement. He fights back, and he begins asking questions of himself. And, and he repeats these questions three times throughout these two psalms. In verse 5, why are you in despair, O oh my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? I mean, he challenges himself. He, he brings himself to a point of self-examination about the state of his sorrow, the state of his emotions. He, he doesn't give in. He, he doesn't give in to them. He wrestles with it. He tries to figure it out. He reminds himself of what he knows. And he finds that... <clears throat> No reasons for being cast down are so strong as those for elation and calm hope. In other words, this self-questioning, this self-contemplation moves him to command himself to put his hope in God. You know, there are times that we need to do that, right? We look around us, we are in despair, we have to command ourselves, put your hope in God. Don't, don't look around, look to him. Because there is no lasting hope in anything else in this sinful fallen world. There never has been. There never will be. And so even though he feels like God is far off, even though he feels isolated, he stirs his mind to override his emotions and his feelings. He, he commands himself, hope in God. He, he continues, I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. What's he doing here? Well, he knows his God is with him. Even though he doesn't feel like it, but he knows his God. He knows of God's character. God does not change. And relief from downheartedness 
is found for him and for each of us in trusting the unchangeable character of our great God. Because this is the great certainty. This is what we know. This is what we have to remember. God has not changed. His purposes have not changed. Yes, sometimes God lets us have these times of despair and dryness. You know, theologians of old uh, not only called it dark nights of the soul, but also spiritual desertion. You ever felt that way? But God lets us have those times. He doesn't take his arms out from underneath us. No, he's still there. But there are times in which he doesn't let you feel his arms around you. Why? Well, I think the simple answer is to drive us deeper in longing for him. And that's what the psalmist does. He wants his God. He wants his hope to be in his God. I love the story of Martin Luther. Uh, you know, one time... In his marriage there, he, he moped around the house for several weeks. He looked depressed. He was discouraged. And one day, his wife, Katie, and if you know anything about Katie, she was quite the character. One day, she came out, and she was dressed in all black. Back then, you only wore black when you were going to a funeral. So she comes out in this black garment, and Martin looks at her and says, Katie, who died? She looks at him and says, God is dead. What do you mean? She said, I've been watching you these last few weeks. It must only mean that you believe God is dead. By your attitude around the house, God is dead. That shook him up. And it's said that he wrote the single Latin word meaning he lives and placed it in his study so every day he'd walk by it and be reminded the truth that God lives. And in a sense, that's what the psalmist is doing here. His emotions, his feelings say, God is far away. He has to command himself, God lives. I need to put my hope in him because I know who he is. So he comes in verses 6 through 10 with a second lament, if you will. He continues to look inward, and he says his soul is in despair within him. He, he recalls the times of worshiping the Lord while in Jerusalem. And he writes here, I remember you from the land of Jordan. He's now northeast of Jerusalem, way up far north, Israel, where Mount Hermon is located. Uh, he further describes it as from Mount Mizar, meaning little hill or mountain. It was probably a lesser peak in that range. No one knows for sure. But he's on the outer edges of his homeland. He's away from the comforts of home, the conveniences of home. He's away from the community of faith at home. And he says, deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. It pictures just one wave calling out to another to coordinate a conspiracy to overwhelm him. He says, all your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. Like a shipwrecked sailor, he's clinging to a piece of driftwood in a raging storm. He's being tossed back and forth, taking on water. He's sinking fast with no hope for rescue. The waterfalls, the, the breakers, the waves that overwhelmed him show his mounting despair. But notice that he knows these waterfalls and breakers and waves were directed by who? By the Lord, by his God. They were under God's complete control. They were working for his good. They were your waterfalls, your breakers, your waves. And even though this son of Korah was overwhelmed by his situation, in verse 8, he could still say that the Lord commanded his loving kindness toward him. How could he say that? He's in the waves, he's in the breakers, he, he's going through difficult times. How could he say that God's loving kindness was toward him? He could say that because this is God's unconditional covenant loving kindness. And God does not change. His love does not fail. Even though he didn't feel it, he knew it was there. In the night, he says, God's song was with him. I don't know about you, but are night times harder when you're going through despair and discouragement or day times harder? Why is it that nights are always harder? Well, probably because we get in our heads a lot, right? But here, the, the, the psalmist, he knows his song will be with me in the night. Uh, when his troubles awaken him at night, he was comforted by the knowledge of God's loving kindness towards him. You know, there was never a time 
when God was not with the psalmist here. He didn't always feel the presence of God, but God was always there. And same true with each one of us. And he continues, he offers a prayer to the God of my life. Because he knew that God hears the cries of his people. He does not turn a deaf ear to them, even if it feels that way. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves, the Lord of heaven and earth, the Lord of this universe, invites us into his presence, does he not? He wants us to bring our cries before him. And we have to remind ourselves, we have access to God, even if it doesn't feel like we do. We have access to God, the the ultimate source of wisdom and power and grace. We have access to the God who is all-powerful, who rules everything. He is our Father. He welcomes us into his presence even if we don't feel his presence. He hears us. He responds to us. No matter how weak our cry is, no matter how riddled with doubt we are, no matter how faint our cry might be, he hears. He cares. He loves. And in verse 9, he reminds himself that God is his rock. He knew his God is a stable rock. He, He could find solid footing even with the crushing waterfall, and the breakers, and the waves. So stop here and think. Back in verse 1, God appears to be absent. He's longing for God. In verse 9, God is his rock, right? And by the time we come to verse 2 in Psalm 43, God is his strength. And yet he asks here in in verse 9 of chapter 42, why have you forgotten me? Ever felt that way? You pray and there's no answer that you can hear. You feel forgotten by God because he hasn't come to your aid immediately. Has God forgotten him? Has God forgotten us? No, of course not. It just feels that way at times. You know, it's really easy when darkness comes to think that somehow God has changed, right? His promises have changed. He's moved on, whatever the case might be. It's not true. My grandson, George, Elizabeth, and Eric's son who's coming up on two years old, he likes playing this game. He calls it dark closet. Yeah, yeah, I asked the same question. What in the world is that? Well, you go into the darkest closet in the house, you shut the door, and you play with a flashlight, okay? It is great fun. You should try it. Go home and do that. Play play dark closet. What's my point? You're shut up in the closet. There is no light. You're surrounded by darkness. But the reality that you left before you came in the closet is still reality, is it not? The lights are on in the house. The sun is still shining outside. You just happen to be in a place of darkness. It would be wrong to be there in that closet and say, oh, no, the light is gone forever. No, the light's still there. The light still shines. But at times it appears that God isn't listening. At times it appears from our viewpoint he doesn't care, but that's not the reality. That's not the truth. And and so the psalmist's prayers seem to be going unheard, unanswered. He's in that dark closet, and he asks himself, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? I, I mean, he's emotionally devastated. He's distraught by the taunting of his enemies. This This oppression affects him physically. What does he say? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me. Literally, it's a murdering of my bones. The the physical pain caused by the relentless attacks of his foes. No, they weren't using sword and spear. No, their taunting was through words and it was still hurtful. It affected him. Once again, the specific taunt is, where is your God? You're going through all this. You're calling out to God. He's not answering you. Where is your God? And once again, to the dismay of the psalmist, this was being said all day long. And so he comes to the second refrain where he repeats verse 5 in verse 11. And in the face of this adversity, he continues to talk to himself. He he repeats verse 5. He says, why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? You know, when we get in those situations in life where we are in despair, when we're disturbed, we need to ask ourselves, why? And he answers, once again, by preaching to himself. He says, put your hope in God. 
He, he encourages his, car, uh, his heart to trust God, the God that he knows, to hope in him with the expectation that he will come through, that God would work. For his good with perfect wisdom, perfect plans, perfect timing, perfect power. Because that's who our God is. And, and while hoping in God, he says what? I will also praise him for who he is. For, for what he's done, for what he's doing, for what he will do. We have to command ourselves to do them. We don't just feel like doing them. And, and, and so as we come to the lament number three in Psalm 43, just in review, in Psalm 42, the psalmist finds himself in difficult times. The, the storms of life show no sign of lifting. And so he continues in Psalm 43, seeking God in prayer. And he begins by using courtroom language. He calls out to his God, vindicate me, O God. Plead my case against an ungodly nation. He wants God to be his judge, examining him. That's a bold prayer, isn't it? He also wants God to be his defense counsel, defending him against the ungodly nation that was threatening him. He asks God to plead his cause before them. He, he wants God to deliver him from the deceitful and unjust people who threaten him. And with growing confidence, he says and boasts in verse 2, You are the God of my strength. You are the one who can defend me from these attacks. And you know, we have to remind ourselves in the tough times of life that God is our strength. We don't have to rely on ourselves. But as his enemies seem to gain an advantage over him, the situation, from his perspective, gave the appearance that God had rejected him. If God was his sure defense, he wondered, there, uh, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? I mean, seemingly, God had rejected him, but he hadn't. And God's vindication of him would be seen in the Lord's guidance, which would eventually usher him to Jerusalem to worship. And so he prays in verse 3 of, of Psalm 43, Send out your light. Send out your truth. Let them lead me to your holy hill, to Jerusalem, to the place of worship. And, and personified as the psalmist's personal guide, God's light. What is that? The divine illumination necessary for a person to understand God's truth. In other words, God-given understanding of God's word would lead him back to worship in Jerusalem. He needed God's providential care to overturn his circumstances before he could do that. But once he got back, he pledged he would go to the altar of God because God was his exceeding joy, the satisfaction of his soul. And there he would praise God with the lyre or harp. And then completing Psalm 43, verse 5, he repeats that familiar refrain once again. He, he again searches himself. He asks himself, why are you in despair? Why are you disturbed within me? How can I be so distraught if God is so great? And so he again commands himself for the third time, put your hope in God. Have confidence in him. Trust God. Him. Don't focus on the circumstances. Don't focus on the enemies. Look upward to your God. You know who your God is. And so with a firm resolve, he determines he would praise the Lord who alone was his Savior and his God. He's aggressive in confronting himself to deal with his despair so he can regain a sense of God's presence. You know, he can't change his circumstances, and often we can't either. But he can change his focus. He can change his focus from himself and his situation to his God. And by the end of the psalm, his circumstances have not changed. But his attitude has. Because he's deliberately focused on the Lord. When drowning in discouragement, there's a simple but sure remedy for the dark nights of our soul, for the spiritual desertion, whatever you want to phrase it. And the cure is always to hope in God alone, knowing that he will never fail, knowing that his loving kindness never departs. Speaking to this whole topic, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a complete book titled Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cures. Let me just read a portion 
He writes, quote, The ultimate cause of all spiritual depression is unbelief. For if it were not for unbelief, even the devil could do nothing. It is because we listen to the devil instead of listening to God that we go down before him and fall before his attacks. That is why this psalmist keeps saying to himself, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. He reminds himself of God. Why? Because he was depressed. He had forgotten God so that his faith and his belief in God and in God's power and in his relationship to God were not what they ought to be. Have you realized, he goes on to say, that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Let me say that one more time. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Now, this man's treatment was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? His soul has been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and he says, self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. He goes on, he says, you have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say to your soul, why are you in despair? What business have you to be disquieted? You must turn on yourself, upbraid yourself, condemn yourself, exhort yourself, and say to yourself, hope in God, instead of muttering in this depressed, unhappy way, end quote. We have to talk to ourselves. We have to preach to ourselves. And on this side of the cross, we know our greatest ground for hope is Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins, triumphant over death. We know that. In times where we feel God is far off, in times of despair, discouragement, depression, the main thing we have to learn is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to ourselves, right? What does Paul say? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. No one. God does not change. We need to learn to preach this, the gospel, to ourselves. We need to learn to respond biblically to the trials and tribulations of life. That's one of the most crucial lessons we can learn as Christians. I mean, God has given us the resources to be overwhelming conquerors, even in the most desperate situations. Romans 8, which I just read, and other verses right around there talk about that. And living by faith means choosing to believe God and his word rather than our feelings and our circumstances. It's important to note in Psalm 42 and 43, there's no mention of the author sinning and bringing God's chastisement upon himself, right? I mean, think last week we talked about Psalm 32. Obviously, there was sin there. Psalm 38, Psalm 51. David's distress in those psalms was due to his sin. And obviously, if we're aware of disobedience or sin in our lives, we need to confess it. We need to turn from it. We need to receive his cleansing and forgiveness. But if we're not aware of any sin in our lives and we're going through these difficult times, we need to be careful to continue walking uprightly before the Lord. Not give in to the temptation to, to, to deny him, to run from him, to rail against him. You know, there is a difference between, uh, and I struggle with saying, there's a difference between complaining to the Lord in a submissive manner and shaking your fist in his face, right? We understand that. The psalmist doesn't mention any sin on his part here, but he's questioning. He's confused. He, he feels as if God has rejected him. And he voices those feelings to God. It's also clear that he had taken a stand for his Lord by testifying to his enemies that the Lord was his God. I mean, they're throwing it back in his face. Where is your God? We don't see him. He's not doing anything for you, which added to his despair. But he didn't want to bring reproach to the name of God. He, he wants to follow God's light and his truth. You know, it must be the same for us. In the midst of life's troubles, and yes, they come to each of us. We have to learn, we have to command ourselves to direct our hearts toward God. We need to anchor our soul in him. 
uh, unwavering hope, and, and this is biblical hope, the sure and certain hope. We have to place that in our God, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our feelings. And to do that, we have to commit ourselves to exercise confident faith in our God at all times. I mean, God does not change. His, his unchanging character should be a comfort to us, should it not? No matter what our circumstances, God knows them. He hasn't changed. He's still there, even though we might not feel that he's there. He alone is the savior, the sustainer of his people, right? He alone can rescue us from the darkest trials and troubles. And we need to learn to see those dark days as an opportunity to seek God, to grow in God, to put our faith in God. You know, this goes against our human nature. Don't just try for quick relief all the time. I mean, the psalmist was in pain, but he realized his true need was what? His God. In fact, he, he begins this psalm by recognizing that above all else, right? He, 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 he knew his God personally before these trials hit. That's important, isn't it? And note how he calls God my God at least four different times. The God of my life, my rock, the God of my strength, God, my exceeding joy. This psalmist was a godly man, and yet he was very discouraged. But what we can see from this as well is it tells us the time to prepare for the dark times is before they hit, right? Get to know your God so that you rely upon him in the dark, dark, dark times. And the psalmist spent time with God. He knew God. Therefore, he had a refuge, a rock, a relationship to turn to in time of despair. So what, how do we apply this? Well, each one of us must learn to seek the person of God just as he does. Uh, I mean, the, the, his, his thirst for God seems to grow in intensity throughout these two psalms. I, I like the way that Matthew Henry put it. He says, the psalmist thirsts for nothing more than God, but still for more and more of him. We should as well. I mean, dark nights of the soul, spiritual desertion, can either wet or dull our thirst for God. You know, God allows suffering to drive us to closer dependence upon him. And the need for the discouraged, depressed, distressed, despairing person is reality with the living God. Hope in him. He is our help, right? Right? Seek the person of God. Also seek the presence of God. I mean, the psalmist here says, I want to appear before you. I want to know the, the help of your presence. And yet sometimes God shows us our need for him by depriving us of the sense of his presence and help so that we'll, he'll drive us to seek him all the more. I think the thirst for God when he appears to be absent or silent is a sign that we are truly his children. If you continue to long for, to seek for, to thirst for. So seek the person of God, seek the presence of God, seek the praise of God. Not God praising you, but you praising God, but to fit the outline, it had to go that way. Never mind. When you're distressed in the darkness, sometimes the last thing you feel is like uh, praising the Lord, right? You want to whine, you want to complain. But praise of our God is a command that's giving to us. It's not a feeling. And the truth of the matter is, if we praise our God, we often feel better than we did before, right? And what is it to praise God? Focus on his attributes. Focus on his actions, what he's done in the past, what he's doing currently, what he's going to do in the future. And as we deliberately direct our thoughts to his saving grace towards us in Jesus, our spirits can't help but be lifted, even though the circumstances may not change. Then seek the precepts of God. And the psalmist talks about God's light and truth. God's word shows us who our God is, even if you don't feel like it. Should I admit there are times I don't feel like reading God's word? Those are the times that we have to force ourselves to, right? Even if you don't feel like, be disciplined, read God's word, see what he has to say. Ask his spirit to shine his light into your discouraged soul because God's truth will lead you to his dwelling place where you will find God to be your exceeding joy, even in difficult times. 
And then fifth, seek God with the people of God. You know, the psalmist seems like he's isolated. He's been taken out of Jerusalem. He's in the far, far north of the country. There's ungodly nations. There's people mocking him. He seems isolated in his depression. And, you know, isn't that often the case? When we get, when we're despairing, when we're discouraged, sometimes we pull back. We don't want people. We want to wallow in our depression. But the psalmist realizes the place of joy where the need of his soul would be met is in corporate worship with God's people. You know, when you're down, you, you often want to avoid people, especially gathering with God's people. I just don't want to face them. I don't want to, whatever. That's what we need, though, right? Go against your feelings. Force yourself to gather with God's people to seek him and to praise him. The psalmist's running refrain in verse 5, 11, and then verse 5 again of chapter 43. Imagine Jesus praying these. Think of Jesus there in Gethsemane. What did he say? He was very distressed and troubled. He said to his disciples, my, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death, right? And I think we'd be naive to think that Jesus' emotions while he was here upon the earth had no correlation to the Psalms. They certainly did. And we see the emotions of the one who came to give his life a ransom for many. I mean, there on the cross, what did Jesus cry? I thirst. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. He's parched. He's weak. He's alone. Perhaps his mind went to the celebration the week before as he came and entered Jerusalem triumphantly. Palm branches are placed before him. Hosannas are sung to him. Not now. Not now. What he heard now were the taunts of his enemies. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. Where is your God? He faced actual separation from God. Not just the feeling that God wasn't near, but actual separation. And he did that for us as he bore our sin, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that we would not be forsaken. Jesus understands what you're going through. He went through it too. But what he did was a substitution, right? Right? He went through all of that so that God would never turn his back, never abandon you, never forsake you. You can be guaranteed that God's loving kindness is with you. His peace and rest are upon you forever. Even in difficult times, in the dark of night, there is hope. Put your hope in God. There is hope because there is Jesus. Jesus is our hope, is he not? So is God himself your exceeding joy today? If not, don't rest until it's true. Keep seeking. Your need is not happiness. Your need isn't relief from pain. Your need is Jesus. So thirst after him. Rouse yourself. Command yourself to seek him as your source of hope and help, no matter how despairing your circumstances. Hope in God. And you shall again praise him because he is the help of your countenance. And he is your God. Father, we come before you thanking you that you never leave us or forsake us. And yet there are times in life that sometimes we feel abandoned or that you aren't listening or you don't know. Father, during these times, by your Spirit's help, convince us that we need to preach to ourselves to hope in you, to look to you, to remind ourselves that you have not changed. Even though if we don't feel your presence, you are there. You know, you care, you love. Father, when these times of discouragement and dark nights of the soul come upon us, Father, may we not drift from you, but may these times drive us closer to you, that we might continue to seek you, that we might continue to praise you, and Father, that you would receive the glory and honor through it. Father, teach us in the good times, teach us in the difficult times. 
Teach us to rely upon you at all times. We have no hope except for you and your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for it in your name.